is to start off by telling you a little bit about Riemannian geometry and Riemann curvature, um, and then some bits about Lie groups, uh, principal bundles, possibly G structures if I can fit them in. Um, and then in the second lecture, we'll go on to talk about uh, define holonomy groups uh, and start thinking about their, their basic properties. So let's have a section uh, 1.5 on Riemannian geometry. Um, so uh, if we uh, let big X be a manifold, then a uh, Riemannian metric uh, is uh, a smooth section G uh, in the sections of the symmetric square of the uh, cotangent bundle. So if you've got the cotangent bundle of X, you can tensor it by itself. That gives things which are like matrices. Um, S2 of T star of X is a sub-bundle of that of things which are like symmetric matrices. That is tensors uh, G A B uh, with two downstairs indices, uh, which is symmetric. So G A B is G B A. Um, so it's some section of this uh, with an extra condition, uh, which is a positive definite. So if you think about this as a matrix, then it's a positive definite matrix of functions, broadly. Um, uh, in other words, um, g of v, comma v is greater than zero uh, if v is a non-zero vector at any point uh, in the manifold. Okay, so uh, the reason this is a good idea uh, is that uh, if X is your manifold and um, uh, if gamma going from 0, 1 into X is a smooth path, so the path of a moving point um, in, uh, in your manifold, uh, you define uh, the length of gamma uh, to be uh, L of gamma is integral from 0 up to 1 of G of d gamma by dt d gamma by dt uh, square rooted uh, dt. Um, and that turns out to be a well-behaved definition. So if you've got a Riemannian metric defined as a tensor like this, then using it you can define the length of paths. And this is a very uh, geometric, intuitive definition. You know, if you think about the, the surface of the Earth uh, as a two-dimensional manifold, then there's a natural metric on it which will enable you to compute the lengths of distances along any, any path in it. Okay, so that's a very uh, standard thing. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a theorem which is very basic in the subject, so basic that it's called the uh, fundamental uh, theorem of Riemannian uh, geometry. This says uh, that if we let uh, X and G be uh, a Riemannian manifold, that is a manifold X with a Riemann metric on it, uh, so then uh, there exists a unique connection in 
Nabla on the tangent bundle TX, which then induces <coughs> other connections on uh, every tensor bundle, such as T star of X, S2 of T star of X, and so on. A unique connection, Nabla on TX, uh, called the uh, Levy Kivata connection. Um, but it's unique subject to the conditions uh, that, well, firstly, Nabla is torsion free. So uh, that's a condition which only makes sense for connections on the tangent bundle. Um, and uh, we kind of agreed that the, the best connections on the tangent bundle are the torsion free ones. Uh, Nabla is torsion free, and uh, Nabla of G is equal to zero. So, as I said yesterday, if you have a connection on TX, it induces connections on all the tensor bundles, uh, and G is a tensor, so this makes sense. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, and so you know, we're going to be interested in the Lebesgue connection of Riemann metric all the time. Uh, so basically, when, when you have a, a Riemannian manifold, you're able to differentiate any tensor on that manifold using the Lebesgue connection. Okay, um, so the uh, Riemann curvature. R, which in tensor notation is R A B C D, so one uh, covariant, in covariant index, three covariant indices. Uh, this is the uh, curvature of the connection Nabla. Uh, you tend to, to talk about it as a, the curvature of G, um, so the Riemann curvature of the metric G. Um, and if you've got a metric, uh, you can use it to raise or lower any index in a tensor. Uh, so um, we also call our lower A, B, C, D, which is G lower A, E, our upper E, B, C, D, uh, the Riemann curvature. Um, so, if you've got a metric, you can use it to lower any index like this. So, so this means that you, you sum over uh, E is 1 up to the dimension of X. Um, also, because this is positive definite, uh, it's an invertible matrix of functions. Uh, so, there's also an inverse matrix, which is just written G upper AB, usually, uh, would be the inverse in uh, S2 of Tx and you can use the inverse matrix to G uh, to raise any index so uh, you know you can move indices up and down the advantage of having all the indices uh, down is that you can then permute them uh, so you're allowed to swap round A and B and see what happens whereas in this form you can't swap round A and B because they're things of a different kind okay um, so the Riemann curvature is a complicated beast. Uh, there's two simpler things you can make out of it, uh, which are the uh, Ricci curvature uh, is uh, our lower AB is our, let's say, upper C, uh, A, C, B. So you take the, the trace on the upstairs index and the middle downstairs index. Um, so you might think, well, there's, lots, there's certainly the three different ways of make, taking traces, but in fact, if you take the trace on the A and the B there, you get zero. And if you take the trace on the A and the D, you get minus a Ricci curvature. So there's only really one interesting way of doing this. Um, so, uh, okay, so, well, it, it has R A B is minus R uh, so plus R, plus RBA, so it's a symmetric tensor. Um, 
So the Ricci curvature is a tensor of the same kind as the Riemann metric itself, uh, except that it doesn't necessarily have a positive definite condition. Um, and finally, the scalar curvature is the trace of the Ricci curvature. Uh, we have to take the trace, uh, let's write this as S. Um, you have to take the trace with regard to the index of the, um, so the, in, the inverse of the matrix, as I said. Um, so now you sum over all A and Bs. Uh, so this is a this is a smooth function, um, and okay. So in two dimensions, uh, for example, um, actually the scalar curvature determines everything, uh, and that's called the Gaussian curvature. And then the Ricci curvature is I don't know half the Gaussian curvature times the metric, and the Riemann curvature is some complicated expression involving only the Gaussian curvature. So, but then in higher dimensions things get more complicated. Uh, and once you're into to four dimensions and so on, then uh, the Riemann curvature has lots of bits to it. Okay, so uh, we call the metric G Einstein uh, if uh, R A B is equal to lambda times G A B. Uh, for some uh, lambda in the reals. So that makes sense because uh, the Ricci curvature and the metric are tensors of the same type. Uh, they have two uh, downstairs indices and they're symmetric in them. Um, and we call G Ricci flat uh, if R A B is zero, so the Ricci curvature is zero, and so that's a special case of Einstein in which lambda equals zero. So the reason why Einstein comes in is that the Einstein's theory of general relativity it involves something which is not quite a Riemannian uh, manifold. Uh, instead of having the positive definite condition, uh, we allow we, we take G to have, let's say, on a four-dimensional manifold, we take G to have three positive eigenvalues and one negative eigenvalue, where the negative direction is time. That's something called a Lorentzian metric. But um, an awful lot of the theory of Riemannian geometry, including, for example, the, the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry, the lever to connection, um, extends also to Lorentzian metrics. So Lorentzian metrics, they're not positive definite, but they have lever to connections, they have curvature. Um, so then, well, Einstein's theory of general relativity in empty space, uh, the Einstein equations just require uh, G to be Ricci flat. If you insert a cosmological constant, um, which you know, might be something to do with dark energy or something, uh, if you're a bit more fashionable, um, then uh, you get the Einstein equation. The, the, this would be the equations for uh, empty space with a cosmological constant. More generally, um, Einstein's equations basically prescribe the, the Ricci curvature of your Lorentzian metric in terms of what the matter in the space and what it's doing. Um, so uh, you know, the, the Ricci curvature is a really important thing for, for physics. Um, okay. Uh, well, it'll follow from things I write down in a moment. Um, well, so the uh, the Riemann curvature uh, satisfies uh, the uh, identities. Um, well, so R A. B, C, D is equal to minus R, B, A, C, D is minus R, A, B, D, C is R, C, D, A, B. So these are symmetry. 
Um, so the symmetry of the Riemann curvature, of the Ricci curvature, will follow from these somehow. Um, I guess actually from that equals that. Then you take a trace, you'll, you'll see it. Um, but in the end, there, well, there's an explicit formula for if you choose coordinates. There's an explicit formula for the Christoffel symbols of Nabla uh, using, in terms of the, the, metri the, the, the components GAB of the, uh, the tensor G in coordinates. And then you can write down an explicit formula for the, Ricci curva for the Riemann curvature, uh, which is rather complicated, but it involves second derivatives of the metric, and then first derivatives of the metric, and things like that. Um, and in the end, it's just an explicit formula. Um, so you, know, you, you can write down what the Ricci curvature is, um, and you can see that it's symmetric in A and B. Okay, so, um, but I, I don't offhand know a kind of more fundamental reason why that should be true. Um, actually, if you had a connection with torsion, I think you'd have asymmetry in the Ricci curvature. So that might be something to do with it. Okay, so uh, our a, B, C, D plus R, A, C, D, B plus R, A, D, B, C equals zero. That's the first Bianchi identity. Uh, so, um, and Nabla E, R, A, B, C, D plus Nabla C, R, A, B, D, E, plus Nabla D, R, A, B, E, C, equals zero. It's the second Bianchi identity. So these two equations hold, uh, well, at least with the A, uh, upstairs. These two equations hold for the curvature of any torsion-free uh, connection. I told you about them yesterday. Uh, these are uh, more to do with uh, Riemann uh, curvature, I think. Okay, and yeah, you can basically just verify these by finding out what the uh, formula for R is in coordinates. So these are all going to be uh, rather important later, uh, particularly when we get to Berger's theorem, because it's going to turn out that there's a uh, very deep connections between uh, the Holomny group of Riemannian metric, which is uh, hopefully we'll get to later on this morning, and um, its curvature. Um, so, you know, the, the Lie algebra of the Holomny group is kind of living in these first two indices of the, uh, of the curvature tensor, for example. So next let's say uh, some very brief things about Lie groups uh, and some slightly less brief things about principal bundles. So um, so I hope that uh, you've all studied Lie groups. If you haven't, I recommend it because it's a beautiful subject. Um, so. A Lie group um, is something which is, well, it's a smooth manifold G. So it's a set G with a, to a topological uh, space structure and a smooth manifold structure, uh, and uh, which has the structure. of a group. So the underlying set of your smooth manifold has a group structure um, and there's compatibility between the manifold structure and the group structure uh, which is that uh, such that um, the multiplication map which we'll write as mu going from G cross G into G, um, and the inverse map uh, 
I going from G into G. Uh, these are both smooth maps. of manifolds. Okay, so you can define topological group in the same way. You could say it's a topological space G with the structure of a group such that mu and I are continuous. But in this case we want this to be smooth. So the one reason why the subject of Lie groups is such a nice subject is that ideas from uh, lots of different directions come together. So you can use ideas about manifolds such as dimension um, uh, you can use ideas about topological spaces such as connectedness, simple connectedness, and you can use ideas about groups like abelian or non-abelian and so on. Um, and you can also use ideas about manifolds such as tangent spaces. So there's, there's lots of different tools you can use to study these things. Um, and because of this, uh, well, Lie groups are very well, very well understood. And in particular, uh, well, so compact Lie groups uh, can be classified. So, well, up, up to questions of um, uh, fundamental group and, and, and kind of connected components, uh, for connected, simply connected things at least, you can uh, give a, a complete list of compactly groups, and that's going to be important later, because the classification of Lie groups um, really depends very much upon the classification of Lie groups. And uh, one of the main tools uh, is that if big G is a Lie group, um, then the Lie algebra is well, you usually write it as a kind of curly G. That's in math frac, if you like latex. Uh, but this is, a, this is just a tangent space, or one way of writing it, is the tangent space to the manifold G at the identity, one, um, the identity of the group, uh, which is thought of as a real vector space. Uh, and then by differentiating uh, the multiplication map mu at 1 uh, and doing clever things, uh, you can define an algebraic operation. Uh, the Lie bracket uh, square brackets. This is a bilinear map going from G cross G into G. Uh, say bilinear, uh, satisfying two conditions. Firstly, uh, anti-symmetry, u comma v is minus v comma u. So the bracket of u and v is minus the bracket of v and u. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, secondly, the Jacobi identity, bracket of u against bracket of v and w, plus the cyclic permutations of this. And that's a complete definition of a Lie algebra, just as that's a complete definition of a Lie group. And, uh, well, so Lie brackets are somehow much simpler objects than Lie groups, because a Lie group is kind of, you know, you've got to specify a manifold and then all these smooth maps, that's an infinite dimensional amount of information. These guys, uh, we've just a finite dimensional vector space and then some bilinear map, so this, this is specified by some finite number of, of real numbers, basically, and arranged in some kind of generalized matrix. Um, and you use algebra to understand Lie brackets, and then it turns out that Lie bracket basically determines the Lie group up to issues of um, connectedness and simple connectedness. Um, so that's the kind of tools one uses to classify these guys. Um, so, so okay, so some uh, important. Families of Lie groups are um, well, orthogonal groups O of n, S O n, 
U of M, uh, S P of M, um, and uh, sorry, let's have Q of M, S U of M, and S P of M, um, and then there's the so basically that these kind of exhaust the interesting families of Lie groups. So a bit like the classification of finite simple groups, you get a bunch of families um, and then you get a, a finite number of exceptional cases. Um, so there are um, five of these. Um, well, G2, F4, E6, E7 and E8. Um, so you know, when you do the classification, you find some some weird things, um, and the weird one G two is going to come up towards the end of our lectures uh, because it's a um, it turns out to be a holonomy group of Riemannian metrics. Okay, um, so and if you has anybody not studied Lie groups? Excellent. Okay, right. So let's now talk about. Uh, principal bundles. So these are like um, vector bundles, but the fiber is a Lie group rather than the vector space broadly. Um, so if we let big X be uh, a, a manifold uh, and big G a Lie group. So then uh, a uh, principal G bundle. OK, so there's two ways of spelling principal. Um, there's principal, meaning kind of most important. And there's principal, meaning some kind of a, a moral thing. Um, this is principal. Uh, many mathematicians, including Simon Lawson, uh, cannot necessarily spell this correctly, uh, but uh, it's uh, important to get it right. Anyway, so principal G bundle uh, over X uh, is uh, a manifold uh, P and uh, a smooth map Pi going from P to X um, and uh, a smooth G action on P such that uh, well um, firstly pi is G invariant um, so that means that uh, well, pi of gamma dotted with little p is equal to pi of p for gamma in G and p, little p in big P. Um, so the G action on p doesn't change the map pi. Um, and, well, let's say big X can be covered by uh, open sets U. Uh, in X um, such that um, well there is a a diffeomorphism between pi inverse of U and let's say g cross u um, uh, and we get a, a diagram there's an isomorphism between pi inverse u and g cross u so the map pi gets you down to u here uh, this is just um, so this commutes So there's an isomorphism here commuting with the obvious projections to U. 
Um, and um, given that we know that pi is g invariant, uh, so which, well, since we know that pi is g invariant, g actually acts on pi inverse of u uh, as well as just on x. Um, so which identifies the uh, g actions uh, on pi inverse of u and uh, the, well let's say uh, g acting on g cross u by gamma can take delta comma u to gamma delta comma u. So the g action on g cross u induced by left multiplication on, of, on g and doing nothing on u. Okay, uh, so, well, so then big G acts freely on big P uh, with uh, P over G is uh, isomorphic to X and that's nearly the definition of a principal bundle really. Uh, it's a, a manifold with a, a free G action um, whose quotient is x, so uh, every point of x corresponds to a g orbit in P uh, and the g is acting freely on that orbit. Okay, uh, so principal bundles, it's a it's kind of alternative language to vector bundles really, and it can be very powerful, so uh, it takes a bit of getting used to if you haven't done it before. Um, and there's ways of trans translating backwards and forwards between principal bundles and vector bundles. Um, so let's look at a couple of these. Well, so firstly, let's say, um, let's give you an example. Uh, if we let uh, x be uh, a manifold, let's say of dimension n, so for short, an n manifold. Um, and then we define that every, every manifold has a natural principal bundle attached to it called the frame bundle. Um, so the frame bundle um, F over X this is a, a principal uh, GL n comma r bundle where n is the dimension of x this is the general linear group um, of rank n uh, oh, this is the principle over x um, so here's how you define it big F uh, is the set of all points a set of all n plus one tuples of little x e1 up to en such that little x is a point in big x and uh, e1 up to en is a basis for the tangent space t little x to big x. Okay, so that defines it as a set um, and uh, if you want to define it as a manifold, um, well, perhaps the easiest way um, would be to say, well, F is contained as an open set, subset of um, the direct sum of uh, n copies of the tangent bundle, uh, because well, so this is this is a vector bundle over X, and therefore uh, a manifold, um, and so that's where E1 lives. That's where En lives, uh, and the condition that an n tuple of vectors is a basis is an open condition on n tuples of vectors. It's just some determinant being non-zero, uh, so that uh, is an open subset, and therefore a submanifold. So this, uh, this defines uh, the manifold structure 
on f. Um, and <coughs> okay, so the projection pi going from f into x just forgets the basis ei. Um, so it maps x e1 up to en maps to x. Uh, and the other thing we need to define is the action of the group gl n comma r on f. Uh, and this acts by change of basis. So the gl n comma r action is well, so let's write a, an element of GL n comma r as a matrix big A i j for i and j is 1 up to n. So this matrix is going to act on the point x e1 up to e n. Um, well, so the point x doesn't change. And then uh, what you do with the basis is you change basis using Aij. So let's have a um, A11E1 one one plus dot 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 plus A1NEN. That's the A1, that, that's the, the new E1 dot dot dot. And finally AN1E1 one plus dot 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 plus ANNEN. Uh, and that's also a basis because the A uh, I J is some invertible matrix. Um, so, <coughs> um, so that is you use the A I J as a change of matrix, a change of basis matrix. Okay. Um, So that's a, a fundamental example of a principal bundle. Now, here's a way of translating between principal bundles and vector bundles. Actually, so this I actually got in, you can think about this as a way of translating from vector bundles to principal bundles, because we, we started with the vector bundle Tx, um, and then out of Tx, we made uh, a principal bundle F by taking the, all of the bases for Tx. So this is really constructed from the vector bundle Tx, as we have going back again. Um, now, if you let P of x be a principal G bundle, uh, and let's also take V uh, to be uh, a finite dimensional Uh, representation of the Lie group G. So uh, G uh, maps into the general linear group of V as a morphism of Lie groups. Um, uh, so then you can take the product P cross V uh, and you can divide it by G where G acts on P by the principal bundle action and it acts on V by the linear representation action. Uh, so this uh, is a vector bundle on X uh, by, well, well, P cross V over G maps to P over G just by forgetting the, the V component, um, but P over G is actually isomorphic to x because g acts freely on p with orbit set of orbits x. Um, and the fiber v, uh, well, so basically every fiber of the vector bundle is isomorphic to v. It's not canonically isomorphic to v, but it's isomorphic to v up to action of some element of g. Um, okay, so. Given a, a principal G bundle, we can make a whole bunch of vector bundles, one for every representation of G. Uh, and actually, using the theory of Lie groups, we can also classify representations of Lie groups. So um, we can 
say a lot about these things using algebra. Um, uh, okay, um, so for example, um, uh, well, f over x, uh, the frame bundle uh, is a, a principal. GL n comma r bundle. Okay, um, so let's take um, v is r to the n uh, to be the uh, standard uh, representation. Of GL n comma r, in which the matrix, well, elements of this can be thought of as column vectors, and the matrices of GL n r act on them by left multiplication by matrices. Um, so then, actually, F cross r to the n over GL n comma r turns out to be isomorphic to um, Tx. Um, uh, one way of thinking about this would be that, well, you can actually identify this with points x, e1. Uh, so if you kind of take your column vector to be the first column of your matrix, um, and then but points x, e1 are, well, okay, apart from the zero and non-zero thing, basically elements of tx. Um, okay, um, but also. Uh, Well, so R to the n star, the dual of this representation, is not is a different representation of GLNR. It corresponds to right action on row vectors rather than left action on co column vectors. Um, and then it turns out that F cross R to the n star over GLNR is um, cotangent bundle, T star of X. Um, and uh, um, can I reach up here? Um, F cross, if we take big tensor to the k of r to the n, tensored with big tensor to the l of r to the n star. So that's also a representation of GLNR. Uh, we divide that by GLNR. Uh, this is naturally isomorphic to tensor to the k of tx, tensored with tensor to the l of t star of x. Uh, so you can get all the tensored bundles this way. Um, okay, uh, and so finally, uh, there is a notion of connection uh, on uh, principal bundles. Okay, so the way I'm going to define it doesn't look very much like the way I define connections on vector bundles, but it's, it's, it can be related to it. Um, so a connection is a, a G invariant uh, vector subbundle H contained in TP, which you think about as kind of horizontal subspaces. Um, so such that TP is the internal direct sum of V direct sum H, where V is the vertical subbundle, uh, is defined to be the kernel of the map D pi, mapping from TP into, uh, well, pi upper star of TX. Um, this is called the vertical subbundle. bundle 
Um, and, well, connections on P induce uh, vector bundle connections on um, all vector bundles connected uh, uh, constructed from P. Uh, okay, um, and also, well, connections on principal bundles have curvature. Um, a notion of curvature, which is very similar to the vector bundle notion of uh, well, notion of curvature of vector bundles. Um, so, a connection at H on P has curvature. R of H, uh, and this is a section of a vector bundle big add of P uh, tensored with the two forms on X, where um, big add of P is a vector bundle on X. Uh, so associated to a particular representation, um, associated uh, to the adjoint representation of the Lie group big G on the Lie algebra little g. Okay, and. Um, Basically, this connection, this curvature, also corresponds under a kind of suitable map of vector bundles on X to the curvature of all of the um, vector bundles you can uh, construct from the principal bundle. So, um, yeah, there's this principal bundle. It's kind of alternative language of vector bundles, which, which um, it can be very useful, especially in, in thinking about holonomy groups. Okay.